So the second of the AERA presentations that I would have had this past week was actually focused upon this particular item here. So this is an article that uh, was published late in 2019. Um, it, basically, we, Jason Psycho and myself, had taken the um, proposal that we had submitted to AERA back at the end of July when the deadline was and then fleshed it out a bit and submitted it to the Journal of Fle Open Flexible and Distance Learning and between the submission to AERA and the actual AERA conference the manuscript was accepted with some minor revisions and uh, then published in their second issue that occurred in 2019. So it was published probably in late November, early um, early December time frame. So you can see the URL up here for the article and what I would have done in this case since it was a published article I probably would have printed out a copy of the article and just walked folks through some of the main points so that's what I'm going to do here now so as you can see it would have been 10 pages double-sided had I printed it out and brought it in and um, just working our way through here, the basic premise of this particular manuscript was there was a online or is an online program in New Zealand, a virtual learning program called HarborNet, uh, which is a one of the e-learning clusters in the country, and it's focused primarily in the Auckland area. And historically, um, over the 25-year history of the virtual learning network in New Zealand, the um, urban clusters have tended to struggle. In fact, a lot of clusters have tended to struggle. Um, and this is evidenced by the fact that at one point in time, there were upwards of 25 of these clusters, and now there's approximately a half dozen or so um, because many of the clusters have failed over the years for one reason or another and the ones that are remaining have often taken up uh, some of the schools that had participated in some of the former clusters but the HarborNet one was an interesting one because the when you look at both the VLN clusters as well as the super loops, which were uh, primarily set up in urban areas, for the most part, they tended to not do that much or in many cases actually ceased to exist or ceased to have much in the way of formal activity. And while virtual learning or distance education was something that they all had as part of their overall mission, very few of them actually ended up doing much of that as time went on. Even um, very little activity in terms of blended learning act actions. Whereas HarborNet really, they were an exception to this. They um, were quite active in their first year, so I had the opportunity to travel to Auckland during their second year of operations. They were um, shortly into their second year, so it was near the end of the first term of year two when this data was collected. And what we were looking at was essentially two questions that I was trying to answer uh, in this particular case study. Uh, the first was essentially what were some of the challenges that they faced both in getting set up and started as well as during their first year and then how did they overcome those challenges and I was specifically interested in things that might have impacted them as a urban cluster that in many cases the rural clusters that had been active and, and had continued to operate um, may not have faced or, or uh, may have approached those challenges in different ways. So um, as you can see there, and I won't go into any of the literature review, but it's a, a brief history of some of the development of virtual learning in New Zealand. Uh, I won't get into the methodology either, but... Uh, 
uh, essentially it was a case study focused around these two questions. The main data collection methods were uh, focus groups uh, along with uh, some individual um, interviews, uh, some site visits uh, going actually out into the schools and to their main internet um, provider that they were using as well as uh, some documents and artifacts that I collected while I was on those school visits. And um, so it tells you a little bit about the case and HarborNet there, and I, I won't get into it beyond what I've already sort of mentioned about it. And I want to pop down here now to uh, the results. So really there were three main challenges that uh, the cluster faced. The first one was technological and communication issues um, and uh, especially between uh, stakeholders and, and um, they also had, um, sorry let me go into that one a bit, so as we were going through one of the the main things was essentially because they were an urban system they were using a internet service provider that wasn't part of what the uh, ministry had normally done and most of the rural clusters had just relied upon the ministry for some of these things but the uh, bridge system that the ministry had put in place to allow for um, the online learning to occur, the virtual learning to occur was set up in a specific way and what ends up happening is that several of the um, schools aren't able to get in to access the system initially uh, both during the test phase as well as uh, during the first couple of weeks of the actual sem semester of their first year and um, one of the, the key ways in which they were able to deal with this was they went through a single um, contracted provider, single internet provider that worked with all of the schools to get them set up and because they were in an urban area it was much easier to accomplish this whereas had they been in a rural area they may have had to deal with multiple companies uh, across the range here and um, you know getting that figured out and then getting it set up and then getting it communicated out to all the stakeholders so that folks uh, felt comfortable about the system and the system essentially didn't start off on a bad foot or was able to overcome some of that uh, initial stumble was one of the key ways in overcoming this. Uh, one of the the second theme that we noticed was that um, one of the challenges they faced was resistance from some of the stakeholders and one of the main things that they did here was they actually partnered very closely with another uh, rural cluster that was in a geographic proximity to the area but also that had a great history with uh, virtual learning in this space so and in terms of their administrative structure there was one e-principal that was in charge of both clusters and then each cluster had its own assistant e-principal so by relying upon the uh, leadership and the experience that had been gained from that initial cluster uh, was something that they were able to um, use and to leverage in terms of getting um, getting buy-in from a lot of those stakeholders. Uh, similarly, the person who they had chairing the board of HarborNet was also picked very strategically. It was one of the principals uh, from one of the Auckland area schools and in all honesty based upon the focus groups that I had there uh, it was clear that this individual was a senior principal in the area was well known well liked well respected and essentially because she was involved in this initiative she brought a great deal of credibility just by attaching her name to the initiative not to mention the fact that her school was also one of the lead schools uh, 
as part of this initiative. So that was one of, I think, the, the key things was that idea of really strategically thinking about how they set up the leadership structure and um, using that as a way to bring credibility to the, the initiative uh, so that the um, they had the ability to uh, essentially overcome that particular challenge. And then the final one was uh, buy-in from the community. And again, part of this was the individuals that were involved in the leadership that they had set up. But a lot of it also was this idea of starting off strong and, and having... Um, uh, sort of a, a big splash, if you will. Um, you know, so they they set up these mock lessons prior to the beginning of the semester that the teachers and the principals could uh, get involved in. They had folks from the Ministry uh, of Education and other individuals within government that they had uh, that were um, part of this uh, initial push to make a splash in the area um, and, you know, trying to really uh, essentially make that good first impression that uh, allowed folks to want to buy in to this particular system. Um, the fact that then, as it's mentioned just where I stopped right there, this idea of, you know, the partnership with Farnet, which was the other geographic cluster that was there, which was one of the first clusters to begin operating in um, New Zealand in the virtual learning space, added a great deal of credibility to the project that, uh, again, uh, got folks to to buy into this larger idea that you had there. Um, so that's sort of you know the the main aspects of the uh, article. Um, I invite folks to check it out and to to read through it themselves, uh, particularly for folks who aren't um, active or familiar with. Uh, virtual learning in New Zealand. I think it gives a good overview of the system in general, as well as uh, a, a nice peek into the early development of this particular um, urban-based cluster. And it's interesting because I'll be perfectly honest and say that the data is actually a bit dated now. This was data that I'd collected some years ago. So while I was there during the cluster's second year. Um, it's important to note that the cluster is now in year six or seven or eight and is still going as strongly or stronger than what they were when I visited them and took a look at what was happening there. So it would be really interesting to essentially go back and replicate this study now, now that they have had this additional time to develop. And we've seen that they still really are the only urban-based cluster that we have in New Zealand. So that's the uh, roundtable that I would have delivered. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below in the comments section.